in terms of market catalysts, isn't this almost a best case scenario? Because a lot of times this stuff happens and we have no idea why. Like in September or October 2018, stocks fell 3.3% in a day. And I, I looked at it back then and there wasn't really a, a reason for it. Actually having a reason, while this this reason comes with its own set of uncertainty, isn't it kind of nice to actually have a reason though, a catalyst? Because eventually that catalyst ends. <laughs> Well, right? it's, it's funny because, well, yes, you would hope that this this certainly ends at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, I think that's a good way of putting it because when stocks fall for no reason, people's antennas go up big time, right? It's like, what am I missing? Right. What, and then they start what guessing news? And- what news is about to come out? What is the market discounting? So, uh, obviously, we have no insight into the coronavirus. Um, I do for this go- show. Kind okay, of. Okay, go ahead. Well, for, before I, so I, I did this a while ago, but if it, if stocks continue to fall and we get a three percent down day, I, I look that happens roughly four times a year since 1928. It's it's pretty rare, and obviously those those days cluster doesn't happen four times well, every year. I was going to say there's probably four times a year. There's probably it probably goes stretches years without one four percent down day. Right. So it, they obviously cluster, but that that's on average it's like three point six of those a year. So it does happen, although it's it's fairly rare. All right, so what do you got on what do you got on the on the uh, on the floor? I've been reading for the last week the Great Influenza, and I have to say this book scared the ever living crap out of me. And but it's also kind of and it's kind of makes me feel good that this stuff we get through it. But so this was the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which it's it's always been called the Spanish flu because that's where it the news reports really broke out for the biggest cases. But apparently it traces back to a soldier in Kansas, some small town in Kansas. I don't know how they were able to find patient zero for this all the way back then in 1918. But the, the reason that this thing got so crazy was because we were in the you know onslaught of people going to World War I from the U.S. And it spread throughout all of these training camps in the U.S. as they were getting ready to fight. And then they all went overseas and just spread it around the world. Hmm. But so listen to this. Some the they got into in the book. It's by a guy named John Barry, and I think it came out in like two thousand six or two thousand seven. So it's a little old, but they actually talk about the coronavirus in here because all of these different strands. Do you know where flu comes from? I have no idea. It, it originates in animals. So like this one is the great Spanish flu was birds. It could be from pigs. It's kind of bizarre, and then when it jumps from a an animal to a human, that's when it mutates and goes crazy. And so here's how he describes this 1918 flu. It was as if the virus were a hunter. It was hunting mankind. It found man in the cities easily, but it was not satisfied. It followed them into towns, then villages, then individual homes. It searched for him in the most distant corners of the earth. It hunted him in forests, tracked him in jungles, and pursued him onto the ice. The way that he describes the flu in this book made me realize that this thing is freaking... I don't even... I never even... I guess it, it kills, according to CDC... Anywhere from 12,000 to 60,000 people annually in the U.S. And most of those people are young people or old people. And they end up having these flu-like symptoms that turns into pneumonia and then they die. But the way that he explains how the flu spreads, he says one thing that makes influenza unusual, when a new influenza virus emerges, it is highly competitive, even cannibalistic. It usually drives older types into extinction. And that's why... People complain when they get the flu shot every year, but then they still get sick, that a lot of times it's it's almost impossible for the shot to take care of what you have. But he also, on the good side of things, he talks about the fact that not all pandemics are lethal. Like, there's going to be the cases where it kills old and young people, but the one in 1918 killed actually mostly middle-aged people in their 20s and 30s because it was such a, an unbelievable strand. But most of the time, it kind of comes in, it wreaks havoc on people. It slows down businesses and people stop doing stuff for a few weeks or a month. And then we kind of get back on the track that we were on and things, people move on. And it, it, it's just, it's insane to me when you read about how this stuff works inside your immune system. It, it, he basically says the body's defenses cannot find it and kill it. And so it, it wasn't like there was this, because he in this book, he talked about how the doctors are searching for a cure or some way to slow it. And it really wasn't the fact that it that they found a cure or anything. It was just the fact that, and it, this is almost such a finance reason for this to stop. 
guess what the reason was that this thing stopped from it started in January of 1918 it basically was gone by February of 20 or 2000 or 1919 and he said the reason that it died was because of reversion to the mean <laughs> that's basically the reason that it stopped he said because if the virus kept going and getting worse and stronger like all of humanity would have been gone basically but because viruses have some sort of equilibrium state this thing got crazy and then it went through people and people's immunity system got a little stronger and figured it out and then all of a sudden it was just gone all right so investing implications well the the crazy thing about 1918 was stocks were actually up that year <laughs> and i think the the biggest which is crazy millions of people are dying in war and they estimate millions of people died from this flu pandemic and stocks were up i think the the peak to trough drawdown was like 10.9% during this. All right, but what, what but about what about today? Big disclaimer: stocks were down 40% in 1917. Okay. And again, this is during World War One, so it's obviously context context dependent. I, I, I it's impossible to say right now. Obviously, I think you said, well, we're only four percent from the highs. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe this acts as an excuse for people to sell. But again, I think in terms of avoiding all the human costs and everything else involved here. Isn't this a good thing if people decide that we're going to have a slowdown and sell off because of this? Because this is something that will likely have a start and end date. And we, again, the, the uncertainty involved in it is we don't know how bad it's going to get. And it could easily get worse because it, stopping this thing is really difficult. Here's the other thing that, that was very mind-boggling from this time period. And so because we were just getting into World War I, the U.S. government did not want to get people upset. So Woodrow Wilson was the president this time. He never once spoke in public about this year-long flu pandemic, which was the worst one in history of the world. No one from the federal government ever mentioned this happening. Can, so back then, they tried to sweep it under the rug, and there wasn't really this... All the resources were being diverted to World War I. Wow. And so all the nurses and doctors and everyone that they had for medical staff was, was there for the war, so no one could really fight this. So the hope would be that we're... Obviously, something like this, it, it would take a lot for this to happen again. But he basically said... You get a handful of these every century, and there's not really much you can do about it, except try to stop the spread. So I would say probably the worst thing, obviously we don't have like solid advice for every individual listening, probably the worst thing that you can do is decide to go all out, pay taxes, whatever, pay capital gains, and then wait for the dust to settle. Like If you really are very worried and you can't help yourself and you feel like you have to do something, maybe like sell a little bit, right? Take like a little bit of risk off the table if you have to. But this idea that you are that you should go from either all in to all out to back to all in when the coast is clear and, you, and then you're going to do this again and again and again for the rest of your investing life is ridiculous. So it's not, it's not don't do anything. I guess going forward, probably if, if, if you're scared, you were probably taking too much risk to begin with. And yeah. maybe- well, so, so someone emailed us today and they said, hey, my brother is thinking about literally selling everything. What advice would you give someone like this? And I think what you're saying is avoid the extremes because that is just a way to play head games with yourself. If you're going all in or all out based on something that you, you have no idea what the path is going to be on this thing. And if you're thinking that way all the time, that is just no way to invest because your psyche can't handle that over the long right. term. Right. So, so let's just say your steady state is 50-50. And this has you really shook. Okay, fine. I get it. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to feel. Maybe instead of going to 0% stocks and 100% bonds and cash, maybe you go from 50-50 to 40-60, 30-70, whatever you have to do. But you have to avoid this all-in, all-out mentality. Yeah. Use this as a way to recalibrate what your risk targets should be because, again, stocks are they're down a lot today, but they're not a down. They're not down a lot from the highs or from, you know, where we just were. <laughs> they're basically back to where we were in January or whatever. So it's not like it's that big of a deal. So yeah, if you want to panic a little, panic a little now, but do it again within the context of a plan. Don't just go out and say I'm going to figure it out later because no one ever does that. No one panics and then figures out the better time to buy later. It doesn't work like that, right? And in and, and any anyone trying to handicap what this is going to do, my takeaway from this book was it's basically impossible. Th this thing could go away tomorrow or it could get worse, but I I'm hoping the fact that we have more more readily available communication systems and, and people can be warned in advance a little earlier, that would help. But 
trying to understand this thing and, and predict which, what's going to happen seems like a fool's errand to me. But here's the thing that I don't really appreciate about this thing from the finance crowd. It seems like there's a lot of people that are almost cheering this thing on, right, to, to crash the market. Yeah, right? it's kind of, that's it, it, icky, icky. Yeah, it, it's kind of a, I, I mean, you know who those people are probably. They're the ones who've been cheering for a crash for the last 10 years. But yeah, I, but if anyone wants to learn about this, I highly recommend this book. It, I've been reading it for the last week and it equal parts interesting and terrifying.